can be seated. Good morning. My name is Cole Nickel. I'm the youth ministry team leader here at the Vine. And um, the point that I want to make at the end, the middle, and the beginning is this, that faith in ourselves is wearisome, tiring, frustrating, doomed. But faith in Christ is sure, it's proven, it's fitting, it's saving, it's restful, and it's freeing. And one of those two options is actually a loss, but one of those two options is of a worth with surpassing greatness, incomparable, radical, and so good even to be called the gospel itself. A few years back, uh, between my junior and senior year of college, I spent a summer vacationing at Marine OCS, uh, Officer Candidate School. It wasn't a vacation, by the way. It's a boot camp for officers. And I, um, the Marine Corps booked my flight up to Quantico, my transportation to Quantico, so it wasn't my fault that I was one of the last ones to be bussed in to show up there. And so when I got there, I realized that my entire platoon had all been issued the gear already, and I hadn't been issued any gear yet. And so I was told, not a big deal, you can get your gear issued tomorrow. I was like, that's, that's, that's cool. And so, um, but morning came uh, quicker than we, we even expected, and so uh, it came with the, the shrill, piercing sound of a female PTI, physical training instructor, screaming, running down the hall, yelling for us to be in our PT gear in 90 seconds. Um, so we're all racing up, and, and uh, I was asking you know, my new buddies if I could borrow their PT gear, because I didn't have any. And so I stripped down to my civilian shorts and no shirt, um, you know, barefoot, and I was just asking guys, hey, can I borrow your stuff? And the first guy was too busy um, getting stuff of his own. The, the second guy um, looked in his locker. His locker didn't have, uh, you know, couldn't find extras. I started to ask a third, and when I was asking a third, um, I heard her voice come back. She was rounding the, the hall, and, and so everybody raced to the bunk line, standing at attention with full PT gear, green shirt, green shorts, uh, white socks, shoes tied, and I was there, no shoes, no shirt, but it was a problem. And so she, when she rounded the corner, um, of course, like my memory, as my memory would have it, she disappeared from down there and reappeared right in front of me. <laughs> and uh, to loudly question my choice of attire, and um, I won't further embarrass myself by telling you the rest of uh, my fumbling conversation, but, but here's what I remember with crystal clear, perfect, sharp clarity the intense feeling and longing in me to be hidden at that moment, to be covered at that moment, to be, to, um, to be in the right. I knew I was in the wrong. I wanted to be in the right. I wanted to blend in. And I think that, you know, at that moment, that, that feeling that I remember having is the, is the feeling, is the longing of each of our human hearts that, you know, we, um, but in front of God's all-seeing eye, we, uh, in our sin and our shame, lie uncovered and naked, and, and God can see that, and so our longing, the longing of our heart is to be covered, is to have a covering over us. And, you know, we, you know um, what, do, what do we do with that? What do we do with that longing? Well, we look for, you know, our goodness or, or our appeal or whatever it is, we muster up things. And Paul says, you know, Paul presents a better option. In the passage that we're gonna read this morning in Philippians 3, Paul tells us about some, another option that we can have, and it's in verse nine, and I quote, we can be found in Christ, not having a righteousness that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness, the covering that comes from God that depends on faith. See, by faith, we can be covered, literally clothed in Jesus' righteousness. That's what we get by faith. And so uh, today we're talking about uh, faith. And, and the question I want to ask is, is, are we putting faith in ourselves or are we putting faith in Jesus and which, which one? You know, 500 years ago was a dark time in the story of God's people and the church. The church leaders were craftily articulating a, a false gospel, and they were telling people that it was up to them. You could be saved by, by mustering up your, you know, your good efforts, your good efforts. And um, the church was completely messed up. There was, there was things going on like that Tim talked about a couple weeks ago where the, the church leaders would even say, hey, you can buy, pay, give me money and, and you'll get forgiveness. Just crazy stuff going on. And God raised up some leaders to cry out against this um, false dependency on ourselves in the church. And Martin Luther and other leaders that God raised up cried out against this and God used that as uh, what we now know as the Reformation and in the Reformation, they reminded us of these five things. And so in this series that we're doing, here we stand in this series, we're rehearsing to ourselves these five solas, these five onlys, these five alones. 
that we can remind ourselves and be refreshed in, and it's that we're saved in Christ alone. We're saved by his grace alone, through faith alone, for the glory of God alone, and we know this by scripture alone. And today we're looking at faith alone. So in the passage we're looking at today, it's written by one of the most influential men ever to walk the face of the earth. It's the Apostle Paul. Um, His writings just transformed a lot of stuff. Paul was a highly educated man. He was very, uh, he was very eloquent. He had poise. He was articulate. He would uh, not use lazy words, but he would carefully choose his words for each given occasion. And he said this, stuff with eloquence like this, everything to my prophet I consider loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. But then in all his eloquence, he then said, I consider everything to my prophet to be crap. And he said, now literally, he said in, in, in Philippians 3, he used the word that was crude back then. And it's crude now. It means human excrement. He, he, he used this word to say, why would such a highly educated man use a word so, known for being so filthy? It's because he saw something. He saw something different. He saw something, and it made him so excited that, that this was better. That everything else that he had was like dung to him in comparison to what he now saw. It was better. Tim Keller wrote this. He said, uh, when the sun comes out, the glorious stars can't be seen anymore. And the things in our eyes, accomplishments, money, influence, power, those things which shone so brightly in our eyes, Paul says something has come out so brilliant he can't see those things anymore. The word translated here, you know, among finding other things, Paul said, I found the super thing. We love things. We love having things. Things bring happiness. And Paul said, wait, I found the super thing. And we know that he's talking about Jesus. He found Jesus. He met Jesus. And so everything else was as profitable as dung to him. Read with me Philippians 3. We're going to read 2 to 11. Paul wrote this with great emotion. He said, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But... Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. That's that word. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. God, your word is uh, awesome and inspired and it's our authority in scripture alone that, is that we um, put our confidence in. Lord, uh, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word. I pray that your word would take root in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I grew up playing basketball, different gyms around my hometown, Aiken, South Carolina. And after getting excited about things of the gospel, when I was high school age, I would try to engage in conversations after playing with different folks. And I remember playing with this group of guys. And when playing basketball, you kind of develop some camaraderie, some some mutual respect for each other. And so I was talking to this guy after playing with him and started asking these series of questions that I had learned as someone taught me to, to kind of run through some questions to open a gospel conversation potentially. So I started asking this question. I said, hey, According to your religious background, do you think heaven's a free gift or something you have to earn? And of course, like 99% of the time, he said, earn. Because that's what the answer that most people gave was. And I said, so if you're, if you're earning your way to heaven, then who gets the credit when you get there? And he said, well, I guess me. I said, yeah, if, if you're earning your way to heaven and you get the credit when you get there, then who are you putting your faith in? And right there in the middle of the Bible belt, you know, he knew the right answer was supposed to be Jesus. But he was forced to say, well, I, I guess myself. So I want to, we kept talking, but I want to pose that same question to us this morning. Who are we putting our faith in? 
And before we just quickly give the pat answer of, oh, Jesus, I want to challenge us. We may be putting faith in ourselves more than we think. I want to break the passage down into two points. First, faith in ourselves. And second, faith in Jesus. So first, faith in ourselves, that's the first uh, few verses, and then faith in Jesus and what both those look like. And the whole reason we put faith in something, ourselves or Jesus, is to measure up, to be acceptable, to arrive, to, to get there. So first, faith in ourselves. Look at verse two. Paul starts out, and you, right in the beginning of the passage, Paul remembers something. You can see this in his, in his writing. He, his fists tighten. He gets angry. He says, he uses harsh words. He says, look out for the dogs. And that term, he's not talking about cute puppies or fun pets. These aren't domesticated dogs, but, but wild dogs, scavenging dogs, dogs ready to kill. He's saying, look out for the filthy, low-life, scavenging, disease-ridden, lowly haters. They're proclaiming something very, very bad. And what is it that they're proclaiming? What is this teaching that makes Paul so excited, so angry? It's, it's works righteousness. It's neat, seemingly not that bad, right? He, sa- he said, it's, it's putting confidence in your flesh. It's the false encouragement saying, hey, you got this. It's saying, hey, follow your heart. It's saying, hey, um, it's, it's the thought that says you need to perform to get there. It's your friend that communicates with their actions. I don't wanna hang out with you unless you're cool enough. It's the thought that says they won't like you until you're likable. And hearing this teaching that it's up to us to, to arrive, to do it, to get there, made Paul so angry and he said, um, look out for the dog, look out for those who are teaching this. They're against the very kingdom of God. It's mutilating the flesh. It's, you know, we think that in, in, it's elevating the flesh to put confidence in the flesh, but actually putting confidence in the flesh actually slashes it down, mutilates it, tears it down. Because when we put confidence in ourselves to do what only God, what God requires of us, and the realization will soon set in that we can't. Our failures will begin to stack up against us and the, it'll multiply the shame, the, it'll increase the anxiety, the worry, the fear, the angst. It, it doesn't work. Uh, illustration, I had a friend who had a boss, a boss eventually drove him out. It, was, it, was, it ended up being rough on him, but he, said, he was in sales. And this boss thought it would be a great idea, for some reason, to place on him and his team um, a completely unrealistic and totally crazy high goal. So he said, Here's, you need to sell this much or you may be let go. Kind of that fear. And maybe thinking that would drive him away from complacency, whatever. So he said that confidence in him and his team ended up hurting them because it wasn't attainable. It wasn't a, you couldn't accomplish that. And so he ended up leaving the company. It drove him out. Another thought, here, here's an illustration. Imagine right here is a chair made of paper. And it's whatever, it's, a, it's art, whatever. So it's a chair made of paper and it's nothing. But, but the moment that I place confidence in that chair, it's precisely my confidence that destroys it. See, our, in our flesh, doing, doing good, it, that's great. But, but the moment we place confidence in our flesh to perform at the level that God would require, it's precisely our confidence that mutilates, that destroys our flesh. We can't do it. We can't put faith in ourselves. So Paul, after, after saying, hey, look out for those outside who are teaching this, then turned to his own heart and gave his own personal testimony and said, hey, look out also for your own heart. Your own heart will proclaim this works righteousness, this, this desire to, to pl- place confidence in yourself. And then Paul goes through this list. Look at verse four. In verse four, basically he said, hey, if anyone else thinks they have reason for confidence in themselves, that person would be me. And at first that might sound a little arrogant, but just listen to this list in verses five and six. He said, in verse, I'm gonna just run through this really fast. Circumcised on the eighth day. When he said circumcised on the eighth day, he was saying, I've been in conformity with the Abrahamic covenant since birth. When he said he was an Israelite, he's saying, I'm not a late in life convert. I've been saturated in the community of a God-fearing community my whole life. And when he said tribe of Benjamin, he said, hey, I've been, I had a great family. I've been uh, one of the two tribes that remain true to the house of David. When he said Hebrew of Hebrews, he's saying, some Hebrews were really Greek speaking underneath. He said Hebrew of Hebrews, he, he spoke Hebrew. He was Israelite through and through. He kept going. He said he was a Pharisee. That meant the highest educational achievements. They were the elite denomination, the elite group in Israel. And that was Paul. He was zealous pursuing the church. Now, it sounds like a bad thing, but it was a good, he was passionate about, about dispelling heresy, about um, getting it out. 
He was the leader. He was the activist in the group. And people esteemed Paul for this. Keeping the law blameless, he said when he would make a sacrifice, he would, or when he would sin, excuse me, he would make a sacrifice. He, no one was on par with Paul. He was in a category all by himself. Everyone esteemed Paul and looked up to him. And what do we have here? We have the ultimate perfect resume. What's a resume? A resume is something you, you, know, you put your work history or achievements on the paper and you use it to get a job. And a resume is, is a case that you make. It's an argument to get inside something that you're currently outside of. Now, this is the ultimate resume. And Paul takes this resume, Paul takes this record that he has, and he holds it up and we expect him to say, now isn't this, you know, look at this, this is awesome. But instead he says, it's all human excrement. And that leads us into the second point, which is trusting in Jesus. Look at verse seven. He said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Listen, I'm gonna run through his resume. Listen to this resume. He had great parents training since birth. He had privileged nationality. He had amazing family. He had the best parents. He had the most prestigious success. He was most passionate in his field, blameless in reputation. Paul was famous for his wisdom, for his leadership, for his success, his zeal. He, up, to, up to his life at this point, there were no losses. Paul was on track for an unparalleled life of success, of acclaim, of reputation. He had it all. So then, much to our shock, verse eight tells us why he considered all of this as loss. It's because he said he saw something that wasn't on this list. Something that was infinitely better, that outshone everything else to the point of where it didn't just dim, but went out of sight. He met Jesus. Paul met Jesus, and, and he said that the worth of knowing Jesus so far surpassed these other things in value that they actually went from the gain column to the loss column. Now, wh why are these things losses? It's because they teased him to trust in himself and, and, and not Jesus. If there is anything that is tempting us to put our faith in, in those things and not in Jesus, that is lost to you. That is poison to us. That is garbage to us. Faith in Christ is beautiful. It's surpassing value, surpassing greatness, Paul said. This knowledge so far surpasses other things that their net worth is zero. In fact, less than zero because that's what a loss is. A loss is less than zero. How is this? How is, how is this? Well, verse 10 says that it's in knowing Jesus. And what does it mean to know Jesus? It means to know him personally, relationally. It means to, to know Jesus as parents and children know each other. It means to know him as wives and husbands know each other. And when you know some, when, you, when children know their parents, if they're trustworthy, they trust them. Inside knowing them, they trust them. And in verse eight and 10, we see that speak of knowing Christ. And then verse nine speaks of having faith in him. You see, they're connected. When we know Christ, we have faith in him. See, faith isn't, when you know someone, you trust them. Faith isn't um, blind, irrational, illogical jumps of uh, baseless hoping. Faith is, is being convinced of the promises of Jesus inside the context of a personal relationship with him. That's what Paul found. And that's what Paul said, this is of surpassing greatness and worth. You know, we all, we all wanna stand justified. We all wanna stand accepted and welcomed. What does it mean to be justified on even a small level? What does that mean? Well, every other religion in the world, apart from Christianity, and every even non-religious system that cultures construct to have order, uh, you do this, you, you present your goodness to the judge or the system or whatever to be welcomed in. Here's a few examples. We present our resume to the boss to be hired. We present our transcript to the school to be accepted. We present our athletic achievements to the coach to be welcomed onto the team. We present our record of morality to the judge to be counted innocent. In each of those cases, it's us doing the work for ourselves to present it to the judge, to the system. We even do this on a relationship level. We present our likableness to this friend group to be counted as cool. We present our looks to this friend group to be deemed pretty. We present our success to this group, this group to be um, respected as put together. We do this in all of our, in just 
subconsciously. But Christianity is different from all these systems in that we don't need to muster up the ability. We don't need to keep trying and striving to measure up because Christ has measured up and has done the work once and for all, and it's finished, he said. We, can, we don't need to place hope in ourselves. We can seek to be discovered, realized, found, as Paul said, in Jesus Tim Keller said, and when I first read this, I had to read it twice. He said, to repent of your sins only makes you an unsuccessful Pharisee. It's to repent of your righteousness that makes you a Christian. I'll read that one more time. To repent of your sins only makes you an unsuccessful Pharisee. To repent of your righteousness makes you a Christian. And what he means by that is to repent of hoping in your righteousness, to repent of hoping in your success, your goodness, your, your being nice, your personality, whatever it is. Because us hoping in those things is the epitome of arrogance. We can't save ourselves. Why do we keep trying? When when we repent of our good works, that's when we begin to see that, that our goodness, in fact, pales in comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus. Faith in ourselves is a task doomed to failure. We can try, but it's, it's going to fail because we don't even measure up to our own standards of right and wrong. Not even our own standards. Faith in ourselves is wearisome, tiring, frustrating, doomed. Faith in Jesus, it's sure. It's been proven. It's fitting. It's saving. It's restful. It's free. One of those two options is a loss. But one of those two options is of a worth with surpassing greatness, incomparable, radical, so good we can even call it the gospel itself. Paul had an amazing resume. He had a fantastic resume, and he could have taken it, he did, he used to, he took that resume and he held it up, and it didn't work, it didn't satisfy, it didn't hold up, it didn't measure up, even Paul's. But when Paul met Jesus, it changed the course of his life for the rest of his life. And when, when, either subconsciously or consciously, we all want to stand justified, be accepted, and in Christ we can be. In, in Christ, by faith, we have, we have those two options. We have two options. Either we can, every other religion in the world and every other non-religion, we can put faith in ourselves or, unique to Christianity, we can put faith in the Lord Jesus. It's only those two options. And it's beautiful and it's freeing to put faith in Jesus because it's a guaranteed win. He's already won. Uh, two stories as I close here. I, uh, Tuesday night, had a long conversation, just random long conversation with this guy. Picture in your head a surfer guy, okay? So he's chill and stuff. And uh, I was sitting, uh, waiting on something, and he came and sat down. He just was ready to talk. And so we just started talking. He started talking about super um, real things, genuine things. And, and um, so I started talking about Jesus. And he almost, he almost lit up a little bit when I started talking about Jesus. And he said, he's like, hey, man, that's so great, for, for Jesus to inspire you. I love that. I love that Jesus inspires a lot of people. I, I encourage that. And he said, I don't, I don't belittle people for, people for being inspired by Jesus. And he's like, I, people shouldn't belittle me for being inspired by other things. And then he kind of sat and wanted to hear my response to that. And so I thought about it for a second. I said, well, it, it, for me to just be inspired by Jesus, I believe that that would be to actually know nothing about him at all. And he kind of leaned forward, ready to hear what I had to say. And I I said, Jesus is different from every other religious figure, every other figure, because he didn't, I'm not just inspired by him, but he actually paid the debt that I owe. He actually wiped my record clean. He won the victory for me. He welcomed me into his family and welcomed me into personal relationship with him. I'm not inspired by him. If I'm inspired by him, I can look at his resume, look at Jesus' record and say, what? I can admire it. I can like it. But in faith, Jesus' record is our record. By faith, what Jesus has done and has accomplished is what we have done, what we have accomplished. In faith, we're united to Jesus in his death and resurrection. So Paul says, this is of surpassing value. This is, this is so amazing. I've, I've got to shout this. One more uh, story I, I read of a man who lived in another place in the world and this man lived in a place that was very unstable. Uh, there would be like one village here might be just be completely taken over by another village, just taken over completely. And 
So it was just a lot of instability. And, and uh, so what people would do, instead of putting their money in their house or their, possession, their, their precious metals or whatever in their house, they would not take it to a bank. They would go and bury it. And that would, that would be the safe way to like keep it. And they would, they would know where it was going. So um, then what would sometimes happen is their house would be taken out and that treasure would stay buried. And so there was this one guy who was uh, one time working in a field and, and he was just a worker, just average guy. And he happened upon some of this buried treasure. And he, he was digging and he found this just massive amounts of buried treasure. And he got so super excited and he, he covered it back up so no one could see. And he went back to the landowner and said, how much to buy the, the plot of land? And the landowner and maybe didn't want to sell, whatever. He gave this price and couldn't afford it. So he went home and with joy, like happiness, happily, started selling systematically every single thing to his name. He sold everything that he had. He sold it, he got every, all the money from everything that he sold, everything to his name, and brought everything that he had back to landowner and, and said, here, and he bought the field. And he knew as soon as he bought that field, it was over. He was now rich beyond his wildest imagination because he knew that, that the value of what he now had so far exceeded, it was like an infinite value. That story that I just told you is actually a fictional story, it's a made-up story, but Jesus actually made up that story and told it as a parable in Matthew 13 to illustrate the value of the kingdom. Jesus said that man with joy sold everything to his name because what he saw was so much more valuable. That man, you could say, was Paul in Philippians 3 when Paul said, but Paul had actually acquired a good bit of wealth. He acquired a good bit of resume. He acquired a good bit of reputation. But then Paul happened upon something and he said, that is so, that so far exceeds in value. What I have, then I'm gonna give it all away. I consider everything else to be lost. And he pushed it over and he said, I want that. And Paul got Jesus. And when he got Jesus, he said, Jesus is of such surpassing worth and value that it so far exceeds everything else. Paul was beside himself like a, like a nobody um, person dating a renowned figure saying, I'm with them. Paul was saying, hey, I'm with Jesus. It doesn't matter that my record doesn't, doesn't measure up. I'm with Jesus now. Are you with Jesus this morning? Do you know that by faith we can be? Just by faith. Faith is acknowledging what Jesus has done for us. It's saying, yes, you did that. Yes, you did that for me. Faith honors and acknowledges and glorifies what Jesus has done. You know, faith in ourselves is wearisome. It's tiring, it's frustrating, it's doomed. Faith in Christ is sure, it's proven, it's fitting, it's saving, it's restful and it's freeing. One of those two options is a loss, but one of those two options is of a worth with such surpassing greatness that it's incomparable, it's radical. It's good enough we can even call it the gospel itself. If you don't believe this morning in Jesus, then I would encourage you to stop waking up each morning, try, doing all you can, wearing yourself out, trying to measure up. Jesus has already done it for us. Put your faith in him. And if you're here this morning and you do believe in Jesus, then my encouragement to you would be the same, to stop waking up each morning, wearing yourself out, trying to be pleasing, trying to muster it up. Jesus has done it. It's finished, he said. So whoever you are, wherever you are, the gospel's for you. Jesus, and only Jesus, is the way, the life, the truth. No one comes to God the Father but through Jesus. Let me pray. Father, I give thanks to you that your son, Jesus, did the work. God, we confess that we are quick to trust in ourselves. We we confess that and we ask you to forgive us for that. We admit that we're wrong to do that. We repent of seeing, of, of trusting in, in our own goodness. And Lord, we fling ourselves on your mercy. We're grateful that, Lord, you did what it took so that we can stand in you and be hidden in you and be found in you. And so it's in your name that we pray now. Amen.